So we're going to be continuing in, in our sermon series, and we're in the book of Esther. Um, and we're in Esther chapter 5. We've been here for the past five weeks. This is the halfway point in the book. Uh, we have five more chapters after this. Um, and this is kind of where the story comes to, uh, if you watch a bunch of Netflix like me, uh, the, end of, the end of today, it's kind of a cliffhanger. Um, and so we're going to be continuing in the book of Esther in chapter 5. So go ahead and turn there this morning. And as you guys are turning there, I'm going to give a recap in case, in case you guys might have missed a, um, last week or a couple weeks ago. And so in this story, right, the story of Esther, we, we titled this sermon, uh, The Unseen King, as we're going through the book of Esther. And it's this idea that all throughout the 10 chapters in the book of Esther, we don't see any mention of Jesus, of God, um, of praying even necessarily, and it's this idea that although, although Christ isn't mentioned, although we don't see any mention of Yahweh here, um, we see his hand at work time and time and time again from chapter 1 all through chapter 10. And so this morning we're going to see that take place even more as I think we see God's uh, sovereignty at work controlling different situations so that his will is accomplished. And so to give a recap, we have four main stories in this character in the book of Esther. You have King Ahasuerus or some might know as King Xerxes, the king of Persia. You have Esther. You have this uh, guy named Mordecai who took after Esther when her parents died. And then you have this evil man known as Haman. And so in, in chapter 1, we see this king. Uh, we, we get this picture of who this king truly is. Uh, this is the king of Persia during this time. Uh, this is also the time in which Persia was probably at its strongest. Uh, to give you an idea of the wealth and power that this king has had, um, the amount of land alone that this man would own would be about the size of what the United States is. So he throws in chapter one, he throws this party for 180 days for no reason other than to boast on himself, to show his power, to show his wealth, to show his standing in the world at this current time. Um, and so chapter one, he throws this party. After this 180 day party is over with, he then has a seven day feast. During this feast, we see him get drunk with wine, and he calls out and commands his queen, Queen Vashti, to come before him, and he wants to show off the beauty of his queen to those around. This very gross picture that he is going to publicly show off his wife so that others might look at her and sexualize her for her beauty. We see Queen Vashti stand her ground and refuse to do so. Um, it does not end well with Queen Vashti, uh, so the king divorces her, leaves her, and then that takes us into to episode two, chapter two, if you will, um, where he decides to play Bachelor, right? If you've ever seen the show The Bachelor, Will made fun of me uh, a couple of weeks ago on that, but he decides to get all of these virgins together, and he decides, I'm going to sleep with every single one of them, and I'm going to figure out who I want to be my next queen. This is where we see Esther and Mordecai um, enter into the story. And like I mentioned, Mordecai is, has, taken, uh, has been taking care of Esther because of her parents uh, passing away. And we see ultimately the king decides to choose Esther to be the next queen. We see God's work, his plan starting to unravel a little bit more. We see in chapter 3, this, this evil man known as Haman, he gets promoted to essentially right-hand man to King Ahasuerus. Um, as he gets promoted, all bow and pay respect to him, all except for Mordecai. Because Mordecai was a Jew and because there was histories between his family and the Jewish family, he decides that he is not going to pay his respect to Haman for the promotion. This ticked off Haman. Haman then decides, you know what? Mordecai should die for this. Not only Mordecai, but you know, all of the Jews. Because of one man not paying respect, all the Jews deserve to die for such a thing. And so he goes to the king, and the king gives him permission to do as he will and order this uh, genocidal decree of all of the Jews in this land. Fast forward into chapter 4. Last week, we see Mordecai share with Esther the news about this destruction of their people. He then begs and pleads with her, go to the king and plea and beg for, if you will, um, to save our people. You are the closest one, Right? And we see Esther as she, she begins more and more in this, this process of what we call sanctification. She makes this bold claim in the end of chapter 4 where she says, I will go to the king and if I perish, I perish. And so that's where we pick up this morning in chapter 5. And so let's go ahead and pray and then we're going to dive into the text and unpack it this morning.
God, we thank you for, uh, for loving us. God, we thank you for allowing us to come together to worship you, to open up your scripture, to, open, to walk into this building with no fear of persecution, no fear of our life that we can boldly approach your throne of grace. God, that you welcome us here this morning. And I pray that as we, we read this, this ancient text that you preserved over thousands of years for us, that although we don't see your name mentioned, we see your sovereignty on display. Lord, apply it to our life. Convict us where we need convict us and mold us more into the image of your Son. It's your name we pray. Amen. So chapter 5, verse 1. It reads, On the third day, Esther put on her royal robes, and stood in the inner court of the king's palace, in front of the king's quarters, while the king was sitting on his royal throne, inside the throne room, opposite the entrance to the palace. And so before we dive deep into the storage, I want to give you a, a quick picture of, of what this actually looks like. Um, this, is, this is the king's palace, right? I've already explained how, how wealthy how prominent this king is at this time in history. This king's palace wasn't simply a room that you would walk into and the, and the king would be sitting on the throne and you could just kind of go let him know what your requests are. But rather, this is the idea his, his throne was up on a platform. You have guards in this room. In fact, uh, if you look at different paintings throughout history of what this would look like, in the paintings there's actually a gentleman that would stand in front of the throne holding an axe. And if anybody was to enter this room uninvited and unwelcomed, and the king did not reach out his golden scepter, that guy had a job to do that day, and that was to kill whoever came in here uninvited. Running down the sides of this, of this palace where the king is setting would be 65-foot tall concrete pillars that's holding up this structure. So you imagine when, when Esther says in chapter 4, I'm going to go to him, and if I perish, I perish, you can see the fear that she might have as she walks into these quarters, not knowing if the king is going to listen to her plea or not. Right? In chapter 1, we saw that the king invited Vashti. She didn't come. We saw what happened to her. And now you have Queen Esther making appearance without being invited. And so it's this idea of what's going to happen next. In some of the uh, Jewish commentaries on, on this text, it actually talks about when she entered... And although we don't have this in Scripture, I think it kind of paints the, the, the picture of the seriousness of the situation. Uh, the Jewish commentaries on this say that she actually entered with two maids, one to hold the train of her royal robes and the other one to actually hold her up as she passed out out of fear. And while we don't know that that's necessarily true because we don't see it in our Scripture, it still paints the picture of the seriousness of the situation that Queen Esther has found herself in. So Esther begins, after she's done with her fast in, in chapter 4, she dresses up in her royal robes to enter before the king's palace. She dresses up to look beautiful, to pay respect to the king with her appearance. And she would know, one, this is to respect her husband. And this is also, number two, she knows by now throughout the history that this king appreciates beauty and he appreciates showing off beauty. And so this is a, a pro move, if you will, for Esther to dress up in her royal robes before making her appearance and before making her request known to the king. So remembering back in season one, he called Queen Vashti to come. She refused. That did not go over well. And now here in, here in uh, chapter five, you see Queen Esther. She boldens up to appear before the king. So just prior to this, she has fasted for three days. And although God's name throughout Esther is not mentioned, more than likely because this narrative had probably been copied from the Persian court records. However, we see God's providential care of his children is nowhere more visible than here. We also see in, in different books known as the Apophrica that she has been praying and spending time in communion with God prior to making her appearance before this king. Matthew Henry writes, when the heart is enlarged in communion, it will be emboldened in doing and suffering for him. And so we see the respect of how she decides to appear to her king, how she dresses up out of respect the text that I was mentioning in the Apophrica, we have her prayer listed, and she, she appeals to God, saying, Thou knowest, Lord, I abhor the side of my high estate, which is upon my head, in the days wherein I show myself. And so we see Esther standing in the inner court over against the king, expecting her doom, somewhere between hope and fear. So church, what we can learn from this, from this first verse here is the idea that, that our faith in God ought to outrank our fear in man. And so the question is, is what have we placed in front of our faith out of fear of something else, out of fear of rejection, out of fear of pride, embarrassment, whatever that might be in our own life? 
Continuing on in verse 2, it says, And when the king saw Queen Esther standing in the court, she won favor in his sight. And he held out to Esther the golden scepter that was in his hand. Then Esther approached and touched the tip of the scepter, and the king said to her, What is it, Queen Esther? What is your request? It shall be given to you, even to the half of my kingdom. And Esther said, If it please the king, let the king and Haman come today to a feast that I have prepared for the king. And the king said, Bring Haman quickly, so that we may do as Esther has asked. So the king and Haman came to the feast that Esther has prepared. Right? So we see, we see Esther, she, she walks in not knowing what's going to happen. And we see that she won favor in the eyes of the king. We see throughout history, right, this king time and time again has cared about nothing but himself. He only cared about his own glory, his own power, his own wealth. But now we see him showing grace to Esther as he invites her to come and share what her requests are. The book of Psalms tells us the king's heart is a stream of water in the hand of the Lord, and he turns it wherever he will. And so we see here the sovereignty of God taking place in the king to allow Esther to come before him and make her request known to him. So all throughout the story as we unpack it, it's not just time and time and time again that things just happen to work out. Or that if you watch the kids' video, as Pastor Jeremy talked about, that, that she got lucky, right? There's no such thing as luck in this situation. We see God's sovereignty over each and every move that's made throughout this text. So time and time again, we see God's hand involved in the story. And although not directly mentioned, because we don't see God mentioned, we don't see Jesus mentioned, it still serves as an encouraging reminder to all of us that regardless of what stage of life we're in, regardless if you feel distant from God, Maybe you might, might not see what's going on. Maybe you not, might not know the reason behind uh, why you're going through a hardship. We're reminded all throughout the Old Testament, in fact, think of the Jews. How many times were they promised? I'm going to be your God. You're going to be my people. I'm going to give you this land that I have for you. And then they disobey God. They go into the wilderness for 40 years. They, they go into captivity in Egypt. And time after time after time, they fail God. God brings them back. They fail God. God brings them back. And it's the, this, this constant story that we're reminded of today that regardless of what life circumstances you're in, if you feel distant from God, you can always turn to the loving Father. This doesn't mean life's going to be easy. It doesn't mean you're not going to have hard times. In fact, it's the opposite, right? Scripture promises persecution. It promises us hard times. So the idea isn't that if you turn to the Father, everything's going to be great and easy for you. But rather, what it means is when you turn to the Father, you're going to, you're going to have this faith in God that outweighs your fear of your circumstances, outweighs your fear of man. You're going to have true joy. And so the king here asked Esther, share with me your requests. What is it that you ask? And I will grant it to you even unto half of the kingdom. This isn't to mean that if she, she would ask for half the kingdom that he would literally give her half the kingdom. Rather, this is a proverbial expression that means nothing within reason that you ask is going to be denied. So we see here Queen Esther not knowing if she's going to be executed on the spot, not knowing how this is going to play out. She makes it in there, but she doesn't ask the king yet. She doesn't simply go, hey, you know that decree about killing the Jews? I'm a Jew, by the way. And... Uh, I think you should take that back, right? She doesn't make her request known at this point. Instead, she invites the king to a banquet, to a feast that she had prepared for him. And notice she doesn't invite just the king, but also Haman. At this point, she's already been told by Mordecai the plan that Haman has put out to kill her people, but yet she still invites Haman to this feast. And then something interesting happens here in the next text, right? And let's go ahead and read it. We're going to see that... Uh, that even after this first feast, she still doesn't bring up her request yet. So continuing in verse 6, it says, And as they were drinking wine after the feast, the king said to Esther, What is your wish? And it shall be granted to you. What is your request? Even to the half of my kingdom, it shall be fulfilled. Then Esther answered, My wish and my request is if I have found favor in your sight, in sight of the king, and if it please the king to grant my wish and to fulfill my request, let the king and Haman come to the feast that I will prepare for them. And tomorrow I will do as the king had said. So if you're reading this like me, you're like, Esther, what are you doing? Like, you made it into the inner courts of the king's palace. 
He told you, hey, whatever it is, I'm going to fulfill it within reason. You have God on your side who's directing the will of the king. You prolong it and, and have this feast. And then after the feast is over, they're, after they're drinking wine, you have this opportunity. And then you prolong it again. You might ask yourself, what is Esther doing here? What, why was Esther so reluctant to make her request known? Matthew Henry suggested that it might be due to, one, her prudence, as she thought more time to ingratiate herself with the king, or that her heart maybe had failed her here and she, didn't, she couldn't find enough courage to make it without further time for prayer. Or maybe it was due to the fact that God's overruling providence uh, would use this intervening time prior to the second banquet to make the granting of Esther's petition absolutely certain. Maybe it was a combination of all three of these things, and she wisely concluded that the king would understand that there was indeed a real petition in the background if she continues to delay it. So there are different views that, that one can take on this, and it doesn't explicitly mention here in Scripture exactly why it is that she delayed it, um, whether it be out of fear, whether it be out of this, this wisdom that she has of plotting and planning. Um, right? She knows that, that last time the queen embarrassed the king in front of people, it didn't go over well. So maybe she's waiting to not make sure to embarrass the king. I personally think it's a little bit mixed of, of a couple things. I, I think that we see the humanity and the fear of Esther. And while she has this fear, God's will still takes its effect. And so the question is, could God have directed the will of the king when she first entered into the courts to accept the demand that Esther makes? Of course, of course he could, right? God doesn't need time. He doesn't need two feasts. He doesn't need wine. He doesn't need banquets to control the will of what he wants to be accomplished. And so I think we see the humanity and fear of Esther here on display as she feared her life. But however, God used Esther. He used her fear to accomplish his plan and his will. And so I think we can pull from this that, that God's ultimately in control, that his will will ultimately be accomplished, but yet he still allows fearful, broken people like Esther, like myself, like each of us here to stumble through it and play a part of his role. And so we see, hopefully that, hopefully that encourages us, right? We see time and time uh, through this multiple parts of Scripture, this idea that people fear, but yet they still obey. They might obey differently, but they still obey. And so church, we're faced here with the reality and the story that sometimes it's okay to be scared. Sometimes we ought to just allow the grace of God to take over and, con and control, right? And that we're, uh, we are called to be uh, responsible to follow the command of God. And so now we have this, this first feast ending, Esther prolonging it, and then now we're going to shift over to Haman as, as we see him head home from this feast. And what we're going to see here with Haman is that I would argue uh, it's better to hesitate like Esther did and do the right thing rather than be rash to do evil. So continuing in verse 9, it says, And Haman went out that day joyful and glad of heart, but when Haman saw Mordecai in the king's gate, that he neither rose nor trembled before him, he was filled with wrath against Mordecai. Nevertheless, Haman restrained himself and went home. And he sent and brought his friends and his wife, Zeresh. And so we see this insane switch in emotions in the man of Haman here. At one second, he's on cloud nine as, he's, as he feels like his power, his influence is finally being appreciated, right? Right? I was invited to this feast that, that only the king was invited to. I'm the second-hand man to the king Hasuerus. And all of this is then flipped around when he sees Mordecai, right? All of that joy that he had has now turned to wrath because of one man. He's filled with anger. He's filled with hatred. And as we look at this, we're reminded this is a result of what happens when we look to temporal and earthly, and earthly things to fulfill that joy that only Christ can truly fulfill. And so at the end of it all, if our joy, if our worth comes from things simply what the earth can bring, we're going to be let down time after time after time. Are we going to have good times? Sure. Sure, there'll be good times through it all. But at the end of it all, it can never fulfill the place of what was meant for God. One commentator wrote, uh, talking about Haman here, he was filled with indignation against Mordecai, 
miserable Haman, honored by both the king and queen of Persia, yet the dis- disapproval of one man makes him feel worthless. This is an accurate description of how empty the rewards of this world truly are. Haman's deep-seated insecurities and need to be honored by everyone means that he can never be happy. God meant this hunger and need for acceptance in each of us to be ultimately fulfilled in Christ Jesus. Ephesians 1 talks about how because we are accepted in the beloved as we appear before God, we are accepted because of who we are in Christ Jesus. And then as we look at Mordecai here, right? Mordecai, the first time around, he didn't pay tribute. He didn't pay his respect to Haman. Chapter 3, we see this issue of, uh, of killing all of the Jews. And now Mordecai sees him again. And you would almost think, like you could almost justify it, right? If, if you were the reader of this thinking, hey man, if, if all you do is kind of pay your respect, maybe, uh, maybe you'll save, save however many hundreds of people. But no, he stands his ground, right? And good for him for that, for standing on his conviction for what he believed was right. And so hats off to Mordecai for standing his ground for what he believes, regardless of what the outcome is. One commentator writes, those who walk in holy sincerity may walk in holy security and go on in their work, not fearing what man can do to them. He that walks uprightly walks surely. So we see this idea here of sanctification has continued in the life of Mordecai. While Esther might still be a little bit hesitant, that's okay. We see this process of sanctification is different for each of us. I mean, look at Will this morning, right? For the first time in history, he took his hat off when he prayed. And so each of us experience sanctification in a different way, and that's okay. So the idea of sanctification isn't our worth, our closeness, our value. Our closeness to Jesus isn't dependent upon how quickly we get there, but rather the fact that we're making progress. So we see here in the text, Haman, as he's walking past, as he sees Mordecai, he restrained himself from harming Mordecai at this point. The question is why? I remember a chapter ago, the king has already given him permission to do as he pleases. He could easily have Mordecai killed here on the spot and justify it before the king and everything's going to be cool. So why does he, why does he restrain himself I would argue here is another instance of God working out his will by restraining Haman not to do anything at this point in time. And as we look at this, as we look at this situation, this story, we notice that, that Haman's problem wasn't just Mordecai. It was the emptiness in his own heart. Even if he solved the Mordecai problem, even if he killed Mordecai here on the spot, it doesn't fill the emptiness that he has in his heart. One commentator writes, the soul was made for God and nothing but God can fill it and make it happy. And so church, the same is true for us. As we look at our failures, as we look at our sin in our life, whatever it is that we, whatever it is that we struggle with on a daily, weekly, monthly basis, they themselves aren't the issue, right? The sins themselves are not the issue. The issue lies much deeper than that. The sin is simply a result of the deeper issue not being fulfilled, which is the fact that that we are born sinners. We have a depraved nature. We are born with what we call original sin or total depravity. And so the deeper issue is that we need the grace of God. And so how can we let God take the place of whatever our deepest insecurities is that each of us have and each of us face each day? If we simply try to face our sins, fix our failures ourselves, we might cut down one simply to replace it with another because we're not fulfilling what the deepest issue truly is. Think of, the, think of the song we just sang, right? This idea that you, you run to the Father, you fall into grace, you don't understand why, you don't understand how, but all you know is you need him. You need him now, over and over and over again. And so may it be said of us that no matter what struggle it is we, we face, we don't try to fix it ourselves. Right? We run to the Father and we fall into His grace because it's by grace alone are we saved. It's by grace alone are we sanctified. We can't do it ourselves. And so in the case of Haman here, it's not a Mordecai issue. It's a deeper issue. So church, whatever it is that you're trying to fix yourself, stop. You can't fix it. God wants to fix it for you. We're plagued with sin. And that is we sin because that's who we are. Right? We're not a sinner because we sinned. That's who we are. It's our nature. That's all we want to do. 
So let's start allowing the grace of God to flow out in all of our life. So continuing on as we finish out these last verses of this chapter, verse 11 says, And Haman recounted to them, talking about when he had his friends over and his wife Zeresh over, And Haman recounted to them the splendor of his riches, the number of his sons, all the promotions with which the king had honored him, how he had advanced him above all the officials, all the servants of the king. Then Haman said, Even Queen Esther, let no one but me come to, uh, come to the feast with the king that she had prepared. And tomorrow also I'm invited by her together with the king again. Yet all of this is worth nothing to me, so long as I see Mordecai the Jew sitting at the king's gate. Then his wife Zeresh and all his friends said to him, Let a gallows fifty cubits high be made. And in the morning, tell the king to have Mordecai hanged upon it. Then go joyfully with the king to the feast. This idea pleased Haman, and he had the gallows made. So we see here as, as Haman sets down with his friends, with his wife, as he begins to, to puff himself up, to brag on, on how great of a man he is, how he's pretty much a god, if you will, in this situation, that he is higher than all the officials, all of the servants. We see him yet again remember that it's worth nothing to him as long as Mordecai lives. Now we see here evident within Haman that really self-admires, self-flatters, are simply self-deceivers. So they plan out this way to kill Mordecai because of the overwhelming hatred that Haman has towards this man. Now remember, the plan to kill the Jews has already been in effect. Like, Mordecai has already have a, has a plan to die. So Haman doesn't need to do this, but because of his, his overwhelming hatred that he has towards this man, he wants to see this man be made a public reminder that nobody crosses me. So as we read this text and as we read the, these gallows here, I want to explain what these gallows truly are. These gallows here is not simply for hanging a victim. So 50 cubits is roughly around 75 feet tall. The gallows mentioned here in Scripture was an ancient way that the Persians would torture people. And what they would do is they would, they would find a, uh, a tree almost, if you will. They would sharpen it to the point. 75 feet tall is what this tells us. They would then put whoever it was on that tree, so in this case Mordecai, and they would let that tree pierce through his entire body until it came out the top of his neck. And he would hang there for a considerable amount of time bleeding out before he eventually died. It was a way that he could let everybody know who walks by this and see it, you do not cross Haman. And so we should never underestimate the destructive and distorting power of hatred. This same irrational, violent hatred that made Haman want to see Mordecai publicly um, impaled, if you will, is the same irrational, violent hatred that made man want to hang Jesus on the cross. And so we see this chapter as it comes to an end. It ends with this cliffhanger on what's going to happen next. Is Esther going to be able to talk to the king before Mordecai gets uh, murdered here? And it's interesting enough, we see God's sovereignty through the story. And so, spoiler alert, a couple chapters from now, the same gallow that Haman has made is the gallow that Haman's going to be hung upon. And so, I want to, I want to close out with this encouraging thought this morning. That although we don't see God mentioned in the story, this unseen king, we see his hand at work in every situation. And this story is really a, a gospel story, right? When you think about it, it's a, uh, as, as, as Christians, what we do is we interpret everything because we know we have the New Testament. We see that all of Scripture points to Jesus. And so like the people, like, uh, like the people of God in the story, the Jews, they're sentenced to death. Church, we also are sentenced to death if we remain in our sin. Just as the people here in Esther need a mediator in Esther to go and plead before the king to save her people, we too have a great mediator in Christ Jesus to be our sacrifice before the Father. We see Esther comes to a proud man, and this morning we get to come to the God of love and grace. We see Esther was not invited into the king's palace, but this morning, church, we are invited to the table we call communion. We see Esther have a law that was ordered against her people. But this morning, we have a promise by our loving king, a promise that leads to life, not a law that leads to death. 
Esther had no friend to introduce or intercede on her, but we have the Son of God who has came and taken our place and intercedes for us. We see Esther approach the king with fear and doubt. But church, this morning we get to approach the throne of grace boldly. And so my hope is, as you see the story of this unseen king, the story of the gospel, uh, this Persian story that we have in our Bibles about Christ, it's a picture of who he is and what he has done for us. 